Hi, I'm Tom Green, and I'm excited that you joined us tonight. Uh, we're going to begin four weeks looking at three chapters in the Gospel of John, chapters 12 through 14. John paints such a unique picture here of Jesus' ministry, of the four Gospels. He really does stand out. The other three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, well, they do a great job of capturing the timeline and the events of Jesus' ministry, and they capture so many of them. But John takes a different angle. John captures only select moments, and he goes deeper, and he digs into the meaning, and he tells a great story, and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And over these next four weeks, we're going to be seeing John show us in, showing us who Jesus is. He's going to show us what Jesus wants from us. He's going to be telling us about how we have a relationship with the Father, and then he's going to introduce us to the Holy Spirit. This is going to be a beautiful study that we're going to pick up kind of halfway in the middle in chapter 12. Chapter 12 is kind of the beginning of the end of Jesus' ministry. And we know that he, he's been with his disciples for maybe three years at this point. Uh, he's been walking with them day in and day out. And as one of those disciples, John, the disciple that Jesus loved, that tells the story. Now, that, that, that name that John gives himself, the disciple that Jesus loved, is, isn't really a statement of favoritism as much as it is in, of understanding. Because you see, John recognizes the love of Jesus. He knows that he is loved by Jesus. And that comes through, through these chapters. You're going to see that over and over again over these four weeks. And so now we pick up the story in progress, it's chapter 12, after all, and there have been 11 chapters. And we pick it up in progress as Jesus is beginning his trip back to Jerusalem. Tonight, if I were to sum up everything we're going to look at, it would all wrap up into two questions. The first is, who is Jesus? And the second is, how do we respond to him? And we're going to look at three interactions with Jesus that answer those questions. So tonight we're going to dig in to chapter 12, and I encourage you to open your Bibles with me. Um, your paper Bible, if you're like me, uh, pull that out if you'd like to pull out your Bible app. I'd, I'd love to read along with you. And tonight is going to be like the opportunity for me to meet Tom Brady, it, my, my football hero. Sorry, New England reference, I'm a New England guy. But, but what if I were able to meet this Hall of Fame quarterback, Tom Brady? Now, I already know about him. I know a lot of facts and figures, and I, I know his big games and things like that. But what if I got to walk with him for a couple of days? What if I got to just go where every, everywhere he goes, do everything he does? I'd really get to know what he's about. I'd really get to know who he is. And that's what we get with Jesus here in chapter 12. We're going to get that picture of Jesus. So I encourage you, whether you're a longtime believer or whether you're still working on who this Jesus is, I want to encourage you just to, to take in who Jesus is, who John reveals to us about our Savior and Lord, and how people respond. Before we begin, I want to pray. Lord, well, we're going to read about you tonight. We're going to read what, what John tells us about you, and I just, I ask that you would allow us to to have the eyes that John had. Allow us to see you the way he saw you. And I'm gonna pray this in your name, amen. So let's begin. We're gonna look at the first encounter that we see of Jesus. And, and in my Bible, it's titled, Jesus Anointed at Bethany. It begins in verse one. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And we stop there and, and set context. Jesus is back visiting in Bethany with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, friends of his. And he's, he's visiting with them for the first time since the last visit, which actually was in John chapter 11. John captures it there. And, and it's about Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. And what a story that is. But now he's back and he's come to revisit his friends. And so we, we pick it up here in verse two. 
Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and then wiped his feet with her hair. And the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. Now, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. I... I I love the responses we see here. We're seeing first a picture of Jesus. Jesus, who is a friend. Jesus, who is a miracle worker, who shows he has power over death. And Jesus, who is worthy of our worship. But then we receive the, see the responses. And the first one we see is Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Well, they're throwing a dinner in honor of Jesus. Why? He's their friend, but, but he, Lazarus is sitting right here, and he was raised from the dead. But Mary's response stands out. Mary takes this jar of perfume, and she opens it and pours it on Jesus' feet. Now, I want you to picture this. I want you to picture this moment. Here's Mary, who pulls out this jar of perfume. A year's wages, we're told, by Judas Iscariot. A year's wages. So in today's terms, that's what, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars worth of perfume. Can you imagine that? And now she takes that and she's pouring it on his feet. And I'm just picturing it's just running off his feet down onto the floor. And then in this most tender and personal um, attendance she can give to Jesus, she takes her own hair and wipes his feet clean with her hair. And the whole house is full of the fragrance of the perfume. I can just picture it. I close my eyes. I can just see that moment. Mary is showing us such a beautiful picture of reverence, of adoration, of worship. See, Mary gets the worth of Jesus. Why? Because her brother is sitting at the table alive. She's seen that Jesus is from God. She's seen that Jesus has worked a miracle and she has seen him. She's heard him teach. She understands Jesus. The worth of Jesus is greater than anything we could offer. But then we see a contrast, Judas Iscariot. Judas' response is completely different. You see, where Mary can grasp the worth of Jesus, Judas can't. Judas can see the worth of the perfume. He can see that. He can see that it's worth a year's wages. But, but it's only that, that the things of this world, the material things that he can grasp, he can't grasp the worth of Jesus, which goes beyond this world. And so he's tied to and worried about the value. It's almost like he would want to weigh his worship on a scale. We see some other responses. There's a crowd that comes to, to see what's going on here. It says some came to see Jesus. Others came to see Lazarus. I can just picture it, right? It, oh, I want to go see Jesus. Maybe he'll do another thing. Others are saying, I want to see the dead guy. But then there are some in the crowd that, that the chief priests are acknowledging are placing their faith in him. Because they know that you don't raise someone from the dead unless you come with the power of God. And they are recognizing Jesus is from God. He's the one that God promised. And so some understand and are following him. 
And then finally, I want to look at these chief priests. You see, the chief priests, well, they were the ones in the position of authority. They were, they were the ones who were supposed to be interceding for God's people to God, with God. And they were the ones in authority that were, that, that were leading, right? And here they are. Are they seeking out? Is Jesus really the fulfillment of prophecy? Is he really the one God promised? Are, are they spending their energy on that? No, they're not. Their energy is spent plotting to kill him. And why? The why is because they're threatened. See, their position of authority, their position as intercessor. Kevin, Pastor Kevin taught us this in Hebrews. Jesus is our intercessor. He is our great high priest. He came to replace the old, the law, the old covenant with a new covenant in him. And so the, the chief priests, their, their role is threatened. Their reality is threatened. I, I'd love for us to just stop and reflect on that. Which of these responses do you see yourself in? Which of these responses would you like to see yourself in? Would you like your response to Jesus to be more like? Do you see a little bit of Mary in your response? Would you love to be able to be more like her? We're going to look at a second encounter with Jesus. And this one is his entry in Jerusalem, into Jerusalem. My Bible titles that he as he comes to Jerusalem as king. Let's read verse 12. It says, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. I want to stop here again, set the context. I love this picture. Okay, so Jesus was in Bethany. It's only a couple of miles from Jerusalem right? The crowd has gone there to see him, to, to see what's going on and to, to watch what's happening. And now the next morning, Jesus is going to make his way to Jerusalem. I can picture some waking up early in Bethany and saying, and hearing, oh, he's going to Jerusalem, he's going. And they run ahead and they go to Jerusalem and start spreading the word. If, if it were today, it would look like this. Everybody would be on their phone and they'd be like, he's coming, he's coming. Social media would be going, blowing up. And word spreads like wildfire that Jesus is on his way. Jesus actually, it's a big deal that he's on his way to Jerusalem because ever since he raised Lazarus from the dead, he knew the chief priests were out to get him. And he knew he goes there and his time is short. So he waited. He's been waiting for the time, the right moment, his time. And now it's his time. And everybody gets the word. Everyone's been wondering, is he going to come to the festival? Is he going to be here for Passover? Is he going to? Everyone's been asking. And now word spreads. He's coming. So let's pick it up from there. And talking about this crowd now. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and he sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that he'd performed this sign, well, they went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Here we see this picture of Jesus. But, it, but it's a whole different picture. We see Jesus as king, the arriving king, the promised one. We see Jesus as Hosanna, literally, Hosanna means save, we pray. Please save us. And so they see Jesus as their salvation, their Savior, their Messiah, the promised one. They are even, it's even captured here the words of Zechariah that, that, that your, your king will arrive on a donkey, gentle and righteous and full of salvation. And so now it's this Jesus who's, who arrives, who comes through the gate. 
And again, we're going to see a range of responses. The crowd, some came to see Tom Brady, right? Some came to see the, the celebrity. Ooh, hey, Jesus is coming. I've heard about that. He's that special rabbi. Let's come see him. Others came to see, oh, is, I wonder if the dead guy's still with him. But, but many have gone over to him. See, the Pharisees are recognizing what the chief priests saw. Many see that Jesus is who he is, who he says he is, who God has promised would come. And so they are putting their faith in him. And then, and then there's the disciples. I am so thankful for the disciples. I really am. It says they didn't quite understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize what these things had been said about him and these things had been done to him. And I'm just so grateful for that. Because I remember when I had not yet grasped who Jesus was. I didn't get to the point that I understood, wait a minute, he's not just a teacher, he's my Lord. And, and, and that took time. And God understands that. If you're in that spot right now, I want to encourage you. God understands that. There is a time that, that that will be revealed, that that will make sense. If it weren't so, would he have put this, would he have prompted John to write this in his gospel that, that truly the disciples were still trying to figure it out? And they've been walking with him for three years. They've seen the miracles firsthand. They distributed the food to the 5,000. They've, they've actually been part of it, and they're still trying to grasp it. So if you're still wrestling with it, take heart. And finally, the Pharisees look a lot like those chief priests, don't they? Threatened. See, the Pharisees come from a diff little different angle, though. The Pharisees were the keeper of the law. They were the, the keeper of the minutia of the law, of the adherence to the strictness of the law. And that was what they were all about. That was their role. That was their identity. That was their status quo. And Jesus came to end that. He came to say, you know, the law exists not to be able to save you, but to show you your need for savior, your need for salvation. And that's what Jesus comes to provide that, to bring that atonement. Well, the Pharisees, that their whole world is turned upside down by that. And so now their, the rules, the laws, the beliefs, everything that they were part of, Jesus comes to says, let go of the old so I can introduce you to the new. It's too much for them. They're threatened. And they throw their hands up. This is doing us no good. This last one challenged me. This, this thought of um, something being a status quo that's just too hard for me to let go of so I can embrace who Jesus really is. And what I found as I prayed about that is there are areas I still don't want to let go of. To grasp who Jesus is, to grasp what he wants of me, what he wants to do through me, what he wants to give me. And yet, I still cling on to the old. So I guess my encouragement to you, maybe my challenge would be, where are you still grasping onto that status quo when Jesus is calling you to the new? And he's got something greater and bigger and beyond what you know today. We're going to look at one last encounter with Jesus. And, and this one's a little different. This one, he's in the crowd. Now he's in Jerusalem. This crowd's not going to take their eyes off him, right? It's a little more complex, but, but it starts with a group of, of Greeks, non-Jews. They weren't raised in the, um, in the Jewish faith. They, they weren't part of that, but they were here in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival. So the Greeks are there and they ask Philip, I would like to see Jesus. And Philip asks Andrew. And then in the very next verse, Verse 23, we see Jesus reply. He's replying right back to the crowd, the Greeks and the Jews. And now he's giving them an answer and, and he's going to start to change the tone. It's a different kind of encounter now. And let me explain. Let me read verses 23 through 26. Jesus replies to them. The hour has come. 
for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jesus is laying out a picture of his path, and it's not at all what anybody expected. A moment ago, he was the arriving Savior and King. He's coming to set things straight. He's coming to deliver us. And now, and now he's talking about a kernel of wheat must fall to the ground and die. He's, he's talking about anyone who loses their life following him. What, what is this all about? Jesus is introducing them to the picture of what his path lies ahead. And he's, he's sharing us, he's sharing this concept of trading our life in this world for eternal life that begins in this world. That's what Jesus offers us. He says, you can trade, let go of the status quo, your life that the world can give you, and instead trade it for what I can give you, which is eternal life starting now here and now, in this world. But that's what he starts to open up, and it's a whole new thought. It's, it's, it's absolutely a whole new thought. Then Jesus, in the next verses, establishes his credibility. Verse 27, my soul is troubled, says Jesus. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it, said that they thought it had thundered. Others that an angel had spoken to him. Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And the voice says, I have glorified. The Father confirms who Jesus is. He comes with authority. He comes with the Father's authority. In this picture, we're seeing Jesus, the one who's going to have to lay down his life, the kernel of wheat that will die, the one who will be lifted up, as he says here in just a moment. But we also see the son who brings glory to his father. This is absolutely an unexpected ending, though. The crowd, I can imagine, starts to look at each other and wonder, what was that? Did he say he's troubled? He's the king. I said, say, I don't know, but I heard it. Everybody's starting to wonder, what is this? This is not what we expected. He's supposed to be the king, the savior, the deliverer. This is not how they expected it to go. And as we look at the re responses, Jesus first defines what the responses are. I want to look at verses 35 and 36. Turn there with me if you would. And in these verses, Jesus paints that there is a choice. Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark doesn't know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. And when he finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from him. He said no more. But a little bit later, he does cry out. He says in verse 44, whoever believes in me doesn't believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Jesus is painting a very crisp and clear picture between light and dark. Jesus is saying there's a choice to be made here. And thus far, his teaching has been pointing people to God and encouraging them and exhorting them to Father, to, to turn to the Father, to seek him, to seek his kingdom. But now he paints it as a stark choice, light and dark. You believe in me? You're in the light. I've come into the world. I am 
the light of the world. And you believe in me, you won't stay in darkness. Or you stay in darkness and you don't know where you're going. He paints that there is a stark choice to be made and it's coming, coming quick. And then the responses. How did people with those choices in front of them choose to respond? Well, first of all, there's the crowd. And, and I'm so encouraged that way back in, I think it was verse 20 that we read that the Greeks were there in, in the crowd. And I'm so encouraged by that. Why? Because you see, thus far, we've been talking about the Jewish people, the Jewish people, but now the Greeks weren't raised in the church. They weren't raised in this faith. And yet they've come to celebrate. They've come to worship God. And, and here, the, the invitation is to the whole crowd. And I'm encouraged by that. You, maybe you weren't raised in the church. Maybe you weren't raised. Uh, you, you didn't have the advantage of a Christian home. And yet, God still has an invitation for you. He says, you can still be sons of light. You can still choose to believe in me. But then in the crowd, as there have been, there are some that have chosen to follow Jesus, place their faith in some that struggle. Matter of fact, let's read about the ones who struggle. It's in verse 37 that it says, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still wouldn't believe in him. This was to, fill, to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Jesus is... is, is done enough miracles for them to be able to believe. He shared enough for them to be able to believe. And, and yet, many still would not believe. Notice it says, would not believe. I want to contrast this with the disciples who, who couldn't figure it out. They wanted to believe. They were believing. But they couldn't quite figure it out. This is saying they would not believe. And Isaiah prophesied this. He says, you know, your hearts will be hardened. Your eyes will be covered. You, you won't be able to respond. You will not respond. And that's exactly what happened. Many have turned away and rejected the choice, the offer. They've chosen to stay in the dark. And then there's another group that makes me even sadder, I think. And that's where we see in, in um, verse 42. And there it says, yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. It just pains me. They saw the truth. They understood. Here's Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's our deliverer. He is our Messiah. And yet, though they believed, and though they knew that to be true, because of what others might say, because of how others might respond, they didn't respond. And I get that. I truly get that. That's such an influence. It's such an influence. They had... They had eternity, they had the opportunity to be sons of light right in their grasp, and yet they couldn't openly embrace that because of fear of what it would mean. They couldn't let go of the old or risk letting go of the old in order to take the new. Such a wide range of responses and such a rich picture of who Jesus is. Tonight, we have seen Jesus as friend, as miracle worker, We've seen one worthy of worship, arriving as king, savior, and yet gentle and righteous. We've seen the one who will be sacrificed, will die, who will be lifted up. We see the light of the world and the son who brings glory to the father. We're going to be discussing this in our discussion groups tonight, and I encourage you uh, to take part in that. But I, I want to encourage you now to reflect on 
Who do, who do you think Jesus is? Who do you say he is? Is there some aspect of, of Jesus that we've seen in, in this chapter that, that maybe you haven't been honoring him in that way? You haven't been acknowledging him in that way. And how do you desire to respond to him? You've seen a myriad of responses. How do you want to respond to Jesus? What, what response do you want to make? Let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. I just pray as I prayed in the beginning that, Lord, you would allow us to see you as John saw you. Would you give us eyes to see the picture of Jesus that he saw right in front of him? In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please remember to join us for a time of discussion beginning at 7.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click join discussion next to the group with the first letter of your last name. We're so excited to spend some time with all of you reflecting on the things that we have learned in this teaching and seeking to apply them to our lives. See you there.